Um, going back to point number one on the nine points that you had there, I think it's on this page, or the previous page. Yeah. Um, Central theme. Yes. Um, were there any requirements placed on, I guess, the recipients or, or whatever of of any of the covenants except for the Mosaic covenant? Were there any requirements? Because like God placed on Himself the requirement to fulfill these, but were there any requirements on the people for them to be fulfilled? Were there requirements on the people? Like Abraham, for the Abrahamic covenant. Yes, I mean, okay, okay. You, you mean the Noahic, Abrahamic, Davidic, yes, and priestly? Yes. Yeah, and then the new... Yeah, the there, okay, the yes, there are requirements that uh, are placed upon the recipients of these covenants, including the Noahic covenants. And uh, that is, uh, again, covenant loyalty in the sense of covenant obedience. All right, the covenant obedience for Noah was, uh, was the fact that uh, uh, there would be justice, that uh, the shedding of human blood would be avenged. And, um, you know, with the, uh, with the Abrahamic covenant that the the same exercise of faith that would lead to righteousness. Uh, that uh, there would be an imputed righteousness based upon faith it was also necessary for those in the Abrahamic covenant as well. And without that imputed righteousness, without that righteousness by faith, uh, that, that, that's why all Israel is not Israel. Right? You have Israelites who are national born a seed of, uh, of, of Abraham, and yet they are going to be judged because they do not exercise Abraham's faith. Without exercising Abraham's faith, they are not able, like Abraham, to keep the law. Now remember, pre-law, pre-Torah, given at Sinai. Uh, Genesis 26, uh, uh, 1 through 5, already calls Moses, uh, already calls Abraham by faith one who kept God's Torah, God's commandments, God's statutes, right? But that is a result of his righteous status. It is not, it, it, it is not a work which produces that righteous status. That's why you need to read the narrative of Abraham or right. And just in case you have a hard time getting it right in the Old Testament, read Romans 4 or Galatians 3, and you'll get it right in the New Testament. I mean, Paul's, Paul there is only exegeting you know, Genesis chapter uh, 15, verse 6, in relationship to the Abrahamic narrative in, in the, the Torah. Um, so, so, is, so is there a, a requirement, even in the Abrahamic covenant? Yes, it is. The requirement is faith. Is there a requirement of the, uh, you know, for the priestly covenant? Yes. A requirement to be zealous for the righteousness of the Lord, to be zealous for Yahweh, as Phineas was in Numbers 25 that brought the, uh, uh, the covenant. And I can tell you this, every, every priest in the future ministering to Messiah is going to have the same zeal for Yahweh, the same zeal directed toward the Messiah that Phineas had for the Lord in uh, Numbers chapter 25. And of course, David, and that also ties into... Um, and it's interesting, I, in fact, this just popped into my mind. I really haven't given a great deal of thought to this. I shouldn't say that because uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but bringing up David and then David's uh, exhortation to, you know, Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 2, that he is himself to be a lawkeeper to the, to the Torah of Moses. And that is reaffirmed, that's reiterated by Yahweh to uh, Solomon in chapter 6 and reiterated again in chapter 9. As well. And even the descendants of Solomon, which obviously is David's line, David's kingly line. They are, they are called to covenant loyalty by obeying the statutes, by obeying the ordinances of, uh, of, of Torah, which neither David nor Solomon nor anyone in David's line did completely until you have Messiah. 
And, and, and Jesus Christ is shown to be the Messiah in the fact that, uh, that he fulfilled Torah. He did Torah. He, he lived a life in conformity to the Torah given to Israel at Sinai through Moses. He is the only individual ever, you know, to have kept that Torah. You know, from the day of his birth to the day of his death, and we can say this to the day of his resurrection. And uh, because of that, that is one of the things that uh, shows that he is the true David. And, um, and rightfully, therefore, because that law has been fulfilled, and we had this conversation during the break, so James knows something the rest of you don't know at this point, uh, in the sense of, of, of my position, and, and we'll see it when we get to, uh, to Jeremiah 31 and 33. And that is the fact that the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, has been replaced by a new Torah, the covenant of the Messiah. And, and Jesus Christ can, can replace Moses. And now there are some things, and we'll see that uh, as we go through the latter prophets, there are, uh, there are aspects of Torah, aspects of, uh, of the commandments that uh, God gave to Israel at Sinai, which are repeated under the new Torah. But there's other, uh, there's no other aspects uh, which are in addition to that. That's the law of Christ, the law of the Messiah. And that's the Torah that Israel will be under. And, and they are able to, to receive the blessings associated with both the Abrahamic and the, the Mosaic Covenant because Christ has fulfilled the Mosaic Covenant. And now they're united with Christ. By faith, they have been declared righteous, uh, imputed righteousness. And on the basis of that imputed righteousness, they live righteousness and receive and uh, receive that blessing, but that blessing now is a messianic blessing uh, that in many ways mirrors what is in the Mosaic Covenant, but again, can, can have additions and deletions uh, compared to what was said to Moses. In, in Jesus Christ, and, and, uh, and, and Christ obeying the Mosaic Covenant and then going to death, I mean, I think uh, Romans 10, 4, that uh, he is, he is the, the telos, he is the end, he is the climax, he is the completion of the law. And so our, our, uh, our and Israel's uh, future is no longer based upon um, the Mosaic covenant, it is in relationship with Jesus Christ and the new covenant. The new covenant literally does, as we'll see, replace the old covenant in all of its particulars. But having answered that, I, there, there is a sense in which that is the key exegetical issue of Scripture. And that is the relationship now of the church and the relationship of Israel in the future, because I'm pre mill to the Mosaic Covenant. I mean, that, to, to me, that, that's, that is the biggest exegetical conundrum. That is the biggest uh, exegetical issue. And, and I am not sure that any of us are going to penetrate to the depths of that exegetical uh, uh, issue this side of being in the presence of Jesus Christ. I think, James, in the millennium, I'm going to be able to answer that question very well. And I think if I was Al Mill, if this was Westminster, uh, I think the professor would say, I think in the eternal state, I can answer that question much better. By the way, in the eternal state, we'll all be able to answer every question much better. Uh, but... Uh, I, but yeah, the, uh, and the reason is, is you think in terms of the Word of God and how much of Scripture is about the Mosaic Covenant. And we're saying, you know, to almost, a, you know, of all the covenants, the one that is mentioned most, I mean, by sheer 
volume throughout, you know, Genesis to Revelation is the Mosaic Covenant. I mean, let's face it. I mean, the whole Judaizing issue in the New Testament was all about the Mosaic Covenant, Mosaic, Mosaic Covenant's relevance, you know, the Gentile believers. Uh, so you think in terms of why so much about the Mosaic Covenant when it's only passing, when it's not permanent? I mean, why does, why does the Bible talk more about the Noahic and the Abrahamic and the priestly and the Davidic and the new covenants, which are, which are the everlasting covenants? I mean, these are the eternal covenants. And gentlemen, I can't answer that question other than saying, well, God is sovereign and, you know, we, didn't know, we need to know, and again, trying to answer my own question, that really all the rest of the covenants only make sense if we truly grasp the Mosaic's covenant's revelation of the depravity of the human heart. Because we know that that is one of the, according to Paul, the overarching purpose of the Mosaic covenants. You know, to, to be a, an educator concerning sin and our need of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. And, um, and God the Holy Spirit must have known that uh, this was the, you know, the great purpose, one of the great purposes of God, the greatest of the purposes of God of the Mosaic Covenant, even though it's passing, and it continues to have that light. And the Word of God is settled forever. I mean, we're still going to be studying the Mosaic Covenant in the eternal state. But it's history. It's, it's going to be educational. So we're going to be living in the reality of the other covenants, but the Mosaic Covenant is still going to be there to, you know, remind us of who we, who we were and why, you know, God's blessing through these other covenants, therefore, was vital. I mean, through the Mosaic Covenant, we come to know the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And we still need that. That's, yeah. But uh, but having said that, I mean, it's still, you know, why the Holy Spirit put so much <laughs> Mosaic covenant, you know, throughout the Scripture. Okay, Lord, I, I I've gotten it. You convinced me. You convicted me of my sin. Uh, well, okay. Here's the next book. Let me let me remind you. I mean, this is Ephesians two one, you know, one to three. Now that even as Paul is you know, speaking there of the Gentile believers who have experienced salvation in Jesus Christ, he goes back and, and reminds them of who they were. That's what the Mosaic Covenant does. It reminds us of who you were that necessitated God's blessing through these other covenants, that necessitated your salvation in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I think even as believers, even those who have had a righteousness imputed to us by God, we still need to be reminded why we need imputed righteousness because of, of how undone we really were in and of ourselves. Well, if someone wants to write a doctoral dissertation sometime in the future on why so much mosaic, transitional mosaic coming in the Scripture, I'd, I'd be the first one to read it. So, uh, that probably went a whole lot further than your question. But does that bring any more questions? I mean, and, uh, and gentlemen, you cannot answer that kind of question without getting into the latter prophets. So that's what I mean, that, that so many times I think we're trying to deal with some of these major exegetical issues within the Bible and, and we don't know the prophets. And uh, I think because of that, um, and I don't, I, I'll confess to you, I'm, I'm here teaching the prophets. I don't know the prophets as well as I wished. I mean, gentlemen, I, I can say this, again, personal testimony. Of all the parts of the Bible, that which I know least are the latter prophets. Someone says, why are you teaching? Because I think I know more than you. <laughs> That's, that, that's the, my only qualification for being here. You know, do it, have I really, to the extent of, you know, of, of Torah, uh, of Gospels, of Paul, of, of Revelation, do, 
do I sense that I understand the latter prophets as well as the rest of Scripture? My answer is no. Um, but that's, I mean, that's on a scale. But when they gave me 502, they didn't say, you know, start with the last half. Well, I did the first couple of years. I followed the, the, the catalog, and, and uh, I spent a lot of times in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, and then had just a little time in the prophets and, uh, and realized why I had to go the other way. Both the students and you know myself as the teacher, we needed more grounding in the prophets. There's a lot of good stuff out there on the wisdom literature today. A lot of good stuff uh, that's available today on uh, on Psalms. And I will feel bad as I feel uh, that will be short change, but um, but maybe it's my own. Uh, I'm confessing, you know, that, uh, that I spend more time on the prophets because I need to get to know the prophets better as well. And then I, and then I salve my conscience by saying, and you do too. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, if, if any part of the Bible I wish I knew better, it would be these four books, the latter prophets. All right, any other questions? So now that I've confessed my ignorance, you know, to you, but, uh, but so we'll learn together. Uh, that's why I love that every, every year. I learn, I learn more together with you as we go through the prophets. I mean, I look forward to 502 for that, for that reason. I'm anticipating reading the prophets. I hope you are too. All right, John. I've always, and this is an interesting discussion that we could probably spend weeks on, but I've always been curious um, how evangelism actually worked in the early days of the church. When we read in like Acts chapter 18, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. They've come from Rome. Claudius had recently commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Um, there were synagogues in every part of the Roman world. And so I'm just really... And Moses was right. And how familiar were these Greeks with Jewish law? Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's a New Testament issue, obviously. And I would say it's a, wide, it's, a, it's a wide continuum. And we'll talk about that in the background of the New Testament. Uh, there were Gentiles who... Um, who went to the synagogue week by week and uh, and heard and and they were they were proselytes. I mean they they came to convert, renounce their paganism and convert to to Judaism and I, I'll put it this way a mosaic uh, a, a mosaic form of Judaism. Uh, the majority uh, knew bits and pieces. Uh, it, it, interesting as you get in the New Testament, I mean, Paul, Paul is referencing, he, he references most the Old Testament in Romans. Over 60%, 70% of uh, Paul's Old Testament quotations and allusions are in Romans compared to his other writings. Um, there was a significant uh, Jewish Christian population, we believe, in Rome when that was written. Uh, but even in, in pure, uh, you know, Gentile churches like, uh, like Corinth and uh, Ephesus, which were, I mean, vastly Gentile, very, very much, very, very little Jewish influence. And, uh, and yet there's an assumption that uh, an, there was a knowledge of, of uh, the Old Testament. There was a knowledge of Torah, when I say uh, Torah, not only the first five books, but also the heart and soul of that being the, the Mosaic uh, legislation. And, uh, and, and certainly as you go through even the letters, even the letters of Gentiles, it's, it's, it's making sense of that Old Testament legislation, what we learn from that legislation, and what is still apropos to the believer and is not apropos to what is what is, a, what is still binding and what is no longer binding? What is the law of Christ? And so you take a look at every imperative in the, you know, the New Testament letters and you're going to see echoes of the Mosaic statutes, but you're going to see other things which are, 
were, are, are distinct and different from, and, and sometimes even the direct opposite of what the Mosaic statutes said. So, um, this, but you said, what did evangelism look like? Well, evangelism looked like the same thing, that uh, you're a sinner and need a Savior. And how do you know you're a sinner? Well, uh, and I've already, I already said, I, I think that uh, the law predominantly was for the Jews to point out their sin and the Gentiles. Look, if the Jews who prided themselves on the fact they kept the law are not law keepers, what does that mean as you as a Gentile? So that uh, Israel's sin, if I could put it this way, stops the mouth of every man. If those who have the law don't obey the law, what does that mean concerning, you know, me who never had the law in the first place, uh, given the Torah at uh, Sinai? So uh, now you've already picked up and I've already said I'm not one who who would hold that, uh, you know, we have to proclaim the law to Gentiles before they are converted. But significantly, the, the synagogue audiences, as you said, would have known as Gentiles at least something about the, the uh, Torah regulations and the fact that they fell short of them. All right, let's, uh, let's move in the last uh, few minutes that we have to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, let me, uh, man, I will drop right down the number four. This is what I've added, the history of interpretation. Isaiah is the most impactful book of the four prophets in both, Christ, in both Jewish and Christian scholarship. Isaiah was the... Um, was the book uh, most quoted in the Mishnah. Uh, we have more material from Isaiah translated in the Dead Sea Scrolls than any of the other latter prophets. Isaiah is, and is quoted or alluded to, and now you've got, you, get into, you get into great debates on what are allusions. But I mean, there's direct quotes over 50 times from Isaiah in the New Testament. Allusions to Isaiah, depending upon which scholar you're, uh, you're reading, will be anywhere between you know, 100 to possibly 300 allusions. Isaiah ranks with uh, Torah and Psalms as the most quoted parts of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Significantly, uh, quotations, allusions to Torah are, are most predominant. Uh, but, uh, but Isaiah is, uh, is, a, is the next. And of course, as I said, there's also uh, a great deal. And, and you can't give numbers because, as I said, the debate on what, what is a quotation. I mean, how many words make a quotation? You know, two, three. You know, uh, how, to, to what extent is something alluded to? Um, we can certainly say this, that the uh, New Testament was well acquainted with the vocabulary of Isaiah. Then uh, into the early church fathers and all the way through to the, uh, the end of the 18th century, Isaiah was viewed as the prince of the prophets. His book was actually called the Fifth Gospel by a number of the church fathers that um, uh, the book continued to have a tremendous impact upon both Jewish and Christian thinking. Change in the 19th century is when you have the, the attacks against the authenticity of uh, Isaiah as the author and slowly but surely obviously the book uh, fell into disrepute uh, because of that. 
it came up to the critical skull to determine what was right and what was wrong, what was accurate and inaccurate. What was theologically uh, right, what was theologically wrong within the book of Isaiah. And so we really have, you know, two centuries of cherry picking uh, within, uh, within basic uh, critical scholarship. That has turned around the last 50 years. Not because liberals have been swayed by conservatives. Conservatives have been a voice in the wilderness, you know, pleading for uh, Isaiah's authorship, the unity of the book, the significance of the book, the important role that the book plays as, as uh, foundational to the New Testament. Um, it is, it is very interesting that liberals themselves have started to reread Isaiah and realize, well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of verbal, a lot of theological connections within the book. So that the movements, even in critical scholarship in the last 50 years, is to read Isaiah more as a unity than a disunity. Rather than saying that we've got two, three, or more parts of, of uh, the book that have been spliced together and are somewhat contradictory, that whoever is responsible for the final book as we have it within the canon has, uh, has basically smoothed out those contradictions so that Isaiah is a basic, uh, is a basically coherent text. And I've uh, used here the Theological Dictionary of the Interpretation of the Bible and Schultz's uh, comment at the end of his section on the history of interpretation, I think is very, very valuable, and that is um, that even though there has not been a return to the significance of Isaiah, there's been a return to the significance of Isaiah as a book. <coughs> In other words, liberals today have, uh, they don't see Isaiah as the author. Uh, they would have a discussion about how, what Isaiah's role is as far as the book as a whole is concerned. Uh, but they have certainly returned to saying, you know, Isaiah needs to be studied as a whole. We'll bring some of the reasons uh, out for that uh, next week when we talk about the uh, structure of, of the book. But it is great. In fact, uh, you can see ancient uh, Christian commentary uh, on Scripture, the Old Testament, ancient uh, Christian commentaries on Scripture. Uh, two volumes are dedicated to Isaiah. Only other book that got two volumes uh, in that whole series was Genesis. In other words, there's so much that is seen in the patristics as they, as they speak of Isaiah, as they preach from Isaiah, as they spoke of Isaiah. So much, there's so much, it's two volumes. Um, so that gives you some idea of the impact as far as uh, the book of Isaiah is, uh, is concerned. Isaiah himself, his name means the Lord is salvation, or the Lord Yahweh will save. And that is universally been agreed that that is the major thrust of Isaiah. Isaiah will, will intersperse restoration passages much more frequently than any of the other three books of the latter prophets. It's almost like Isaiah cannot, cannot, as he's putting his book together, just cannot go, you know, a number of pages on the scroll until he's got to break out and talk about the Lord's salvation. And of course, the last 27 chapters are devoted to, to a, a, a continual outworking of how the Lord is going to save, how the Lord is going to deliver. In fact, uh, gentlemen, you're going to be disappointed when you get to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, although Ezekiel has the lengthy section. 
you know, from uh, the end of uh, 33 all the way to, to chapter 48. And he has a few, a few previews of coming attractions in uh, previous chapters. But, uh, but nothing in, you know, chapters 1 to 33 of breaking out, speaking about restoration. I mean, the first 33 chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah is reflected again and again and again on the coming restoration, both of Israel and the nations. So because of that, I think, uh, uh, not only with the profundity of thought, he was a master of uh, the Hebrew language. He is a second to Moses as far as uh, the, 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 the synonyms that he uses. Um, gentlemen, if you, if you don't, <laughs> if you're having problems with Hebrew, the last place you want to try to translate is Isaiah. He's, he's going to give you an education in Hebrew like you can't imagine. Um, you know, you better have your lexicon ready to go and your grammar's ready to go because he's going to throw everything at you. Um, it's just a tremendous book. And, uh, and I'm sure it is, along with obviously the profundity of thought that is, is there and how it really sets the agenda for the rest of the uh, prophetic books, as we'll see. But I, I think it is this, this emphasis upon salvation, which if, uh, which if anyone ventures into the latter prophets, means they're going to venture into Isaiah. Because we like the message. But we venture into Isaiah, and this colors our mind about the rest of the prophets because I think Isaiah has written more things hard to understand than the other prophets. In fact, you know, when we get to, uh, to Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12, in many ways, they are, they are much easier to read and comprehend than Isaiah. Well, uh, We'll talk probably two weeks from now about Isaiah and hopscotch. How Isaiah, from one sentence to another, can, I mean, he can be here, he can be there, he can be in the far distant future, and back again to the near future, back again to the, to the present, and, and, and in one oracle. I mean, he, he spanned 25, you know, 2,500 years of history, and still counting. It's almost a sense in which, well, at least Ezekiel, I mean, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12, I mean, at least they, they give you a whole section of this is the way it was. All right, another section, this is what you can ex ex expect in the near term. Here's what's going to be in the distant future. I mean, Jeremiah, again, basically puts everything in the future in, in one little section of his book. Ezekiel, a longer section, but the same. The 12 tend to, to do that. Isaiah is the one who's all over the place. I think a lot of people stumble over the interpretation of the prophets because of their confusion in reading Isaiah. But having said that, I, I appreciate why the confusion. Isaiah is not an easy read. It's, it's not an easy read because of the particulars that it's the easiest read because you rejoice in what Yahweh has done to save his people. And if you're saved, you love to rejoice in that salvation that God has provided for you. So, so there's a sense in which we like Isaiah on one sense because of his emphasis upon salvation, but on the other hand, it is not the easiest book to unravel. So, welcome to the world of Isaiah. The Lord is salvation. As I've said, he's introduced in 2 Kings uh, 19. And uh, referred to in equal fashion in 2 Chronicles. His focus... And I've listed there, focus upon Judah, Jerusalem, Zion, 
And uh, then his two terms for city, and I put those verses where it's clear from the context he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. Now, Isaiah is, uh, you better get your atlas out, gentlemen. He's going to have a lot of geographical terminology along with the nations. He's going to throw in cities along the way. So it's, uh, it's going to be a real travelogue. If you can't afford to go to Israel, read Isaiah. If you can't go on the seminary trip, well, Isaiah is your substitute. Okay. And I just give you Judah's referred to 29 times, Jerusalem 49 times. You can take a look at every verse I've given to you in the uh, previous note. Zion 49 times. And the Zion usually standing, you know, for Jerusalem. Zion obviously being the hill upon which the, uh, the temple had been built uh, by Solomon. I, I'm, well, actually, Zion is actually the hill upon which David uh, conquered and became um, the hill upon which he reigned. And then he built, obviously, a, a terrace um, to the, uh, the temple mound. To, to connect it, uh, Solomon did, to connect it into the, um, uh, to the palace uh, complex somewhat. So, so Zion stands both for the religious center and the political center of, uh, of uh, the nation, Judah. And uh, so both of these are, and again, I've listed the places where Zion obviously refers to a portion of or stands for Jerusalem as a whole. Also refers to Israel 92 times, predominantly to Israel as the northern kingdom, particularly in the early chapters, but then later, obviously Israel becomes uh, associated in captivity with all of the, those who've gone into captivity. And we'll come back to this in structure but also the emphasis upon Assyria and Babylon. Assyria, the dominant nation at the time when Isaiah prophesied, and yet he already knows about the importance of Babylon in the past, in the present, and particularly in the future. And of course, that ties into the prophecy that uh, you read in, um, in the First Kings chapter 20, which is uh, repeated almost verbatim in Isaiah chapter 39. Historical Isaiah knew that Babylon was going to be the Lord's instrument of judgment upon Jerusalem. So I want to repeat that this is very vital. Historic Isaiah knew that Babylon would be the Lord's instrument of judgment upon Jerusalem. Why is that important? Because how could historic Isaiah know so much about what God was going to do through Babylon if he didn't live through what God did through Babylon in Jerusalem? I mean, this is the whole reason why you've got to have a second and third Isaiah. Because the first Isaiah didn't know enough. And my answer to that is, yes, he did. And if he knows the essentials, why can't God give him further details? I mean, I, I don't think that in the end, Isaiah said necessarily everything he knew about Babylon to Hezekiah. But he knew the essential. I mean, even the essential is right there. Historic Isaiah knew. Yahweh was going to use Babylon in the future to judge Jerusalem and Judah and take them into captivity. Now, we don't know so much about Isaiah, but I do know about uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And when God told them certain things, they, they asked questions. Jeremiah in particular is well, he, a very inquisitive prophet. Lord, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, Daniel is the same. What is this all about? So 
So I gave someone an argument from silence, but don't you think Isaiah might have said, hey, look, I just told, I just told Hezekiah about Babylon. Lord, can you give me a few more details? Now, even if he didn't ask, I mean, he could come back to his home just like a Nathan and Second uh, Samuel chapter 7 and got more details. <laughs> of course, Nathan was corrected. Uh, give him more details about uh, David and the temple. But, um, but I know that uh, Isaiah knew a whole lot more because we're going to see that within the, uh, the book. So, so the focus, I mean, really, there is a sense, a real sense, in which Isaiah is going to be a book about two cities. So is, um, and, uh, so is Jeremiah. Jerusalem and Babylon. All right, and along with that, uh, get to know the kings. Hosiah, a good king removed because of his disobedience to the Lord. Jotham, a good king. Ahaz, an evil king. Oh, I wish I had time to expose it for you, 2 Kings chapter 16. How bad was he? He was mucho bad. He trusted the Assyrians more than he trusted Yahweh. That's how stupid he was. He goes to Damascus and sees the great altar there, sends the um, sends the blueprints back to Jerusalem, has it built, becomes, becomes a means of idolatry and apostasy within the land. And by the way, that uh, took place after the destruction of uh, Damascus at 732 B.C., which means what you read in Isaiah chapter 7 is before the narrative you read in 2 Kings chapter 16. When a king refuses to trust Yahweh, look at the result. But Ahaz was an evil king. Hezekiah, his son, a good king. His son Manasseh, the most evil king of the south. Isaiah ministered during a period of political, social, and uh, religious upheaval in Judah. They went from being independent to being under the vassalship, and then the military control for a time of Assyria. They went from good kings to bad kings, to back to a good king, back to an evil king. So things during his lifetime, I mean, <laughs> you think you might live in a time of some real roller coasters. Uh, Isaiah lived in a roller coaster time period. Called the ministry, we believe, in 739 B.C. Gives his last historical statements in 681 B.C. Doesn't seem when we get there to be prophetic. Uh, chapter 37, verse 38, seems to be speaking about a history that has taken place, historical narrative. And uh, you can uh, add up the dates. That gentleman is 60 years of life. If he's a young man, about 20, he's going to live to be in his 80s. Jeremiah probably the same way. Daniel in the same way. And one of the reasons they have a long book is they're around a long time. They saw a lot. They said a lot. So in the end, they write down a lot. And uh, sometimes during the latter years of Hezekiah, maybe even into the years of Manasseh, Isaiah retreats from public view. Nothing, we, we can't date anything within his book after uh, 701 B.C. And God called him to reflect 
and to write down in a book what he had seen and what he had heard and what Yahweh had given to him. Now, one of the things that I've also done, you might want to run this off. I've done it for each one of uh, the first three of the latter prophets. And what I've done is kind of help you get it all together in your mind by this chart. Well, don't get it in your mind. You can have the chart in front of you. Cheat. All right? But what I've done is try to put everything together on um, where things are in the Bible related to Isaiah, his life, his ministry, his book. Talk about the major historical events that took place and then Isaiah's experience as spoken about in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah makes very few connections. Here's again a problem. He makes very few connections to specific individuals and events. He speaks much more in generalities. And we're going to again find out this is much different in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So very, very little. I mean, Isaiah really receives in the background of his book. So it's a book by Isaiah, but it's really not a book about Isaiah. And, uh, and so much of what he says in his book is undated. When did he say that? I don't know. Why did he say that? I don't know. So why have in this class? I know. <laughs> because we want to learn what God has revealed to us through Isaiah.